Now there's some really critical food plot basics that whether you're a seasoned vet at planting food plots or a newbie, you really need to pay attention to um, at a much higher level than most people do. And, they, and this even goes for really experienced people. We'll go through these basics, but we're gonna talk in depth about each basic and why it's critical on how to make sure that you're getting it right when it comes to making sure that you have a beautiful field of green for this fall. You know, the biggest priority you talk about right here is even just what do you plant your food plots for? Now you can plant food plots and get deer to go to them during the summer, but what does it do for you? What does it do for them? During the summer in the top two thirds, north two thirds of the states, deer have several times more food during the summertime by and large, and this extends even into the deep south during the summer months compared to the fall or winter, meaning it's lean during the fall and winter. But during the summer, they have way more food than they can even consume, high quality food too. Lots of different plants and varieties that are available at that, uh, that, at that time, even if you're not around ag-rich country. But if you're in ag-rich country, like we are around here, the alfalfa, alfalfa beans. And I even like when my neighbors have beans for, for food plots because they can go feed over there during the summertime. And, but by and large, you're not really doing anything to their health at that time. So a lot of people don't have acres of food plots to waste during the summertime. And it magnifies the problem. If, you're, if you have great summer food plots, then you're attracting a lot of does to those food plots. Those does stay into the fall and now you have a population problem because they have fawns, fawning ground, good fawning grounds territory. You're making thick cover for the fall and winter months for hunting season and during the winter, browse. That's what deer need during the summer. That's what does and fawns need during the summer. So getting that good food and they stay. So bottom line is, I wanna see you focus your food for fall. That's really important for the deer too. That's at a time where the local habitat's taking a nosedive. It's at a time where you can greatly improve the nutritional levels and give them solid food going into the winter time, in that hunting season time and actually helping them. So they go into the winter with a full tank, full tank of energy reserves, fat reserves, and that allows them to make it through the winter and actually come out of the winter in very good shape. A lot of times what we do right before the winter and right after, meaning rye or wheat, that even is available before clover, and clover is available before alfalfa. So in the pecking order, rye or wheat's available in the springtime before clover even. That's that green forage they can get to when they're just getting out of that post-winter recovery, and they're re really starting to get ready for the summer and uh, nursing mothers for fawns, and then also antler growing bucks too. So you really have to think about those timing, and, and that's a really critical issue. That'll determine what, what you do plant. You know, you're trying to get as much volume as you can going into the hunting season that'll last the longest and track the most deer to your property without getting so big that you can't step foot on the property without spooking deer. You're trying to offer food at the right time so you're not exacerbating the problem of too many does. If you need to build a herd, you want to have summer food. So again, what to plant determines when to plant, why, what is your goal for your food plots. Again, everyone has different goals, but bottom line is if you're raising your population, you need a lot of summer food and fall food. If you want to maintain a certain number of deer, then you get rid of the summer food, just offer fall, and that's at a time when they need it actually physically the most too. Hey, thanks for watching the video, and we'll be right back, but this is very important. This is a very important announcement. We have our Camp Kicking Bear event. We have it on Father's Day. It's more of a habitat day. We're gonna see a feature of habitat improvements, how they will all relate to a bedding area, a water hole, food plot, bedding point, morning stands, evening stands, and then we get to take a tour around the majority of the property too. Bottom line is $350 per person times 50 people. We highly encourage you to bring your kids. After all, it's Father's Day. 50, those 50 spots always sell out very fast. On that same day, it's from 10 o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon. We have speaking events. All my sponsors kick in for that. So we'll literally be giving away a Matthews boat, a ghillie blind. And so one person will win each of those. For about 13, 14 people will win really good prizes. I could list them all, but check it out. We also have our $100 times 100 hunt raffle to a lucky hunter that'll come hunt with us the end of September for three nights. So really check out all that information. Look at the link in the description. You can ask Jessie, she'll help you out with any scheduling of that and uh, look forward to seeing you guys there. It's a great event. Every dime that's earned goes directly to Camp Kicking Bear and even a little extra on top of that. So look forward to seeing you there. So a lot of it comes together and oh, by the way, you know, not coincidentally, that's a great time for your hunting season, obviously. If you have great food in November, October, and December, November being that first priority in most hunting seasons, then you're going to be able to have that opportunity to build a great herd too and actually be a herd influencer. Because you know, somebody I saw a comment the other day, well, we have great bucks in September, October, and then they're gone. 
And so we still have a good hunt because that's when they plan to shoot their deer. Well, they're not a herd influencer. That means they're not holding deer in October, November when they're getting shot and pushed around. You can't control the herd then. So I don't want to hunt just in September, October. I want to actually have a good property for the entire year. And so when you have food plots, think about that balance and when you need it the most. Let's go through some of these critical basics. Sunshine. What does that mean? Obviously, everyone knows that plants need sun to grow and food plot seeds are no exception. But some will tout that their food plot blend, we don't do this, but that they have a shady food plot that'll grow in the shade. It'll grow in wet areas, whatever the case. But especially when it comes to shade and the lack of sun, the answer to planting a shady food plot is to take trees on the south side of the plot and cut them down so you actually get sunlight onto the plot. I always think of that six to eight hour rule a day for full sun. Look at a 90 degree window of your arms. That's gonna be about eight, nine hours of sunlight in a wedge to the south somewhere. Could be that you're getting 40 degrees here, 30 degrees here, 20 degrees here, and it's totaling up to 90 degrees. But bottom line is, you wanna make sure you get about that amount onto your plot, and so it takes cutting trees down because there's no shady food plot mix. It'll grow well in the shade. You get one-tenth the volume. You don't want to move around in a giant, giant area to get the full volume and have to move 10 times as much as they would on a good food source to otherwise do so. It's sparse, weak plants. So think about that. Always get sunlight to your plants. So that's critical. Think about that too as it relates to competition. If you have a clover field, that's why you can't put brassica seed into the clover and expect it to grow or even rye. Rye is shade tolerant. Brassica is not, but both won't grow under a canopy of clover. So that's why you have to kill the clover, till up the clover, expose soil. Get your seeds on the soil. Make sure when they germinate, they get full sun because if they germinate and they're covered by canopy, they will die. They have to have sun. So this applies to a lot of different factors when you say you just have to get sun. That's why it's a critical basic. It's almost an advanced basic because a lot of people don't think of, you know, getting sun. Yeah, they need sunlight to grow, but how does that really relate to shady food plots, canopy? You have to make sure you get sun to those germinating seeds. Now a, a, a bean, a soybean, will push up about two, two and a half inches a liter. So it has the ability to hit sun where a a uh, small seed of clover. Think about those smaller seeds that have less energy to push up a liter. So like a small seed of clover or even switchgrass might push up a liter a quarter inch high. So if it doesn't hit sun, it dies. Seed to soil contact. Everyone knows seed to soil contact. You got to throw seed on the soil. Yeah, I've even seen people in the past, they'd have a mat of vegetation and they made up a word like translocating so they can put Seed on top of that vegetation, the vegetation's moist, and in theory, the seed will grow down through the vegetation onto the soil. Folks, that doesn't work. It has to be on the soil. Um, you know, again, something we learned decades ago, but you have to have good seed to soil contact. That means your seed has to be on the soil. That means if it's a larger seed, especially a pea or a bean, even a little tillage radish to some extent, it has to be covered up a little bit or it has to be covered most of the way with soil. So it can be sticking out a little bit, but if you get a dry period and it germinates, it'll die. That's why you want it down in the soil where there's more moisture and it continue to thrive and live even though the upper layer of the soil is dry. That's why it really plays into when you actually plant. Because if you have good seed to soil contact, but then it's a dry period, that's not a good thing either. So you have to have moisture, number three. You have to have adequate moisture. That's why I really encourage you to plant late summer plots because in most areas, except for the arid southwest, maybe some areas in the southeast, you get increasing moisture patterns as the fall progresses. So you plant in um, the thunder showers and, and uh, thunderstorms of August and you get those brief showers. It continues to grow. Then you get a little bit more rain in September, a little bit more rain in October. And that's where you get those patterns. You don't need a lot to get those annuals to stay alive. You just need timely rains. Or if you try to plant something, a uh, clover field in June, you're really subject to, you, you wanna plant a oats cover crop like we do here, like the farmers are doing right now for oats over hay, alfalfa, and then you mow the oats out, it acts as a nurse crop. But bottom line is you're really subject to drought during the summertime, and you're really open to failure at that time. So that's why I like late summer. You're planting at a time when weeds are dying, and uh, weeds are not thriving, your food plots will thrive, moisture's on the increase, and that's really good. Along with, with uh, moisture, enough moisture, seed to soil contact, enough sun, brings me to another main point I could have left up here, but it's kind of a combination of all three of these, and that is weeds. You can't have weeds. They rob moisture, 
They make it so you don't have good seed to soil contact. They make it so you, the plants get, get sun. It makes them weaker. Give an example, um, you know, some talk about weeds during the summer are a good thing, and there's more diversity in the food plot, but that is horrible because as it goes into fall, those weeds just compete for nutrients. And I'll give you an example of switchgrass. You know, different kind of planting, not a food plot, but it's the same. I had a client in Michigan recently, weedy part of the field that was higher, less weedy part of the field that was lower. The weedy portion of the switch was six, eight inches high, and the non-weedy portion was 15 to 18 inches high. The stalk was almost twice the size on the non-weedy portion than the weedy portion. The weedy portion stunted the growth and decreased volume and size overall. So a food plot that has 10% weeds and going into the fall reduces 50% of your volume. Really bad. So you have a 10 acre plot, let's say you have 40% weeds, 50%, you can be left with just 5% of volume. So you spent the time and resources to plant 10 acres. But because of weeds, going into October, November, December, the most important time of the year for your food plotting to take place for herd health and your hunting success, herd building, being a herd influencer, that food plot is a waste. Waste of time, waste of money. You can't afford to have weeds in there. So you need to address weeds with all of this. It's really, really important. And there, you know, one way is repeated tilling. You just till, till, till every three or four weeks, three or four times. And you can get to a point where you're setting back the weeds enough where you can get a decent fall crop, but you're always gonna have weeds growing in or you use chemicals. We, we choose to use chemicals, then a buckwheat cover crop that's also a smother crop. There's no other crop like that, trust me. And then you go into the fall uh, with a spraying right before your fall plots. And so you get two sprays in instead of three or four or, you know, trying to... We've had times where you sprayed in early May, forgot about June, where we just couldn't do it. Then you come back and spray the end of July and the weeds are four feet tall and we can't have a food plot. Because those weeds now are soaking up moisture, they're shading out and, uh, and they're limiting the seeds to get through to even get to seed to soil contact. And when they do, they germinate and they're under shade and canopy and thatch. So a really bad problem when weeds come in because it limits these three right here. Now pH, pH is critical. That's where you add lime. We use plot start in lieu of lime or both. So we're using both there this year. We're adding lime and then we'll add a two and a half gallon jug per acre of plot start. And then we add plot boost once those plants, it's a foliator. So we add that once the plants are growing, they're four or five inches tall. We spray it right on the plants. It helps them uptake nutrients. So I like that, that dual purpose where we're using plot start. We're using um, the recommended amounts of lime. And if we're cutting the lime a little bit, then you add a little bit more plot start. So it can, it can actually take care of that. But bottom line is you have to address pH. And a lot of people will put fertilizer out, but then they won't address pH. Folks, if your pH isn't right and you either amend the soil with plot start or allows to take the plants that uptake the nutrients without changing the pH of the soil, or you add lime that actually changes the pH soil of the soil for long term, plot starts more of a that growing season time, then the plants can't uptake the nutrients either way. So it's critical that you address the soil concerns of pH prior to fertilizing. Because if you fertilize and you haven't addressed pH, the plants can't take those nutrients to the fertilizer, you're just wasting your fertilizer. It's just sitting in the ground, the, the plants can't take it. Because the pH is too low, they can't take those nutrients. So always lime. If you had to choose between one or the other, lime instead of fertilize. That's when you need to do it. So there are some of the basics. Um, when it gets down to a lot of times they're planting in early greens and brassicas, August 1st around here. That might be, you know, that's southeast Minnesota, southwest Wisconsin, all the way down to Louisiana. That might be September 1st for those same green products of brassica or early season, like our fall power greens, big boost brassica. That might be more Labor Day down in the south and more August 1st around here. When we're planting rye or layering rye on products, that's more early September, and that could be early October down in Louisiana, Alabama somewhere down that way. So always look at the timing, your seed choices. The bottom line is I'm trying to get as much volume as I can going into the fall hunting season. That'll build bodies, energy reserves, fat reserves going into the hunting season or into the winter time and make sure those deer come out of the winter time in great shape by having rye wheat mixed into in those fields well before clover and well before alfalfa. So critical concepts of food plots, they're basics, but there's a lot to each point that goes well beyond the basics. And I thought it was very important for you to understand that uh, going into this planting season this year. And you know what, we're going into the spring planting season right now. I'm planting a few clover plots, but out of all my food plots, 
totaling over 20 acres in two states. We'll have about an acre and a half to two acres this year of, of clover and spring planting. We do have some corn that'll go into that needs to be spring planted, but the bulk of my food plots in green will all be planted more uh, around that August 1st to September 1st time frame around here. So we're still a long ways away, but a lot of people are thinking food plotters because the farmers are out in the fields getting ready and planting. But should you actually be planting food plots right now? I'll let you decide on your goals and what's going on with your herd. Again, if you want to raise a herd, you need to plant during the summertime and fall. If you want to stabilize a herd, even a herd reduction, you want to make sure you only plant in the fall. But uh, follow these basics, understand the timing of your plots, and you'll be on the road to a successful food plot. And not only a successful food plot this year, but a successful opportunity to build your herd and have a great hunt this fall. Now, I don't know if you've checked out our main website lately, whitehabitatsolutions.com, but we've really had a lot going on, including hats, books, our web class, and certainly our new seed company, WHS Wildlife Blends. When you click on seed on our site, it'll take you right to our brand new site for the seed company. We have all 12 blends available. So check it all out though. I encourage you, I appreciate you checking it out. Whether you buy anything or not, really appreciate you visiting the site and uh, seeing what's going on and continue to watch because we have big things coming later this year.